is, can I legally ask my employees to install a tracking program on their cell phones? Yeah, I mean, so a lot of employers tend to have these privacy concerns with their employees. Um, and a lot of times it could be fact specific, but generally speaking, if you're asking an employee to put a program on their cell phone so you can reach them during work hours, that generally should be fine. There shouldn't be any issues there. Um, but obviously you wanna be mindful if in any way it's going to bleed over into their personal life at all. You wanna make sure that it's just within the scope of them carrying out their job. Um, the other consideration I think is whether or not it's this employee's personal cell phone versus a cell phone that was given to them, you know, specifically for work. Um, if it's specifically just a work cell phone, I, there really shouldn't be any issues there. If it's their personal cell phone, then you may want to think about um, potentially expense reimbursement laws. So if you're requiring your employee to have a cell phone so you can reach them, certain states have laws that say that you need to reimburse your employees for any sort of expenses that you require them to incur to carry out their job. Um, so that's just one consideration here is whether or not this is a personal cell phone or a cell phone that's specifically for work. Those are excellent points. I would also just suggest, you know, if you're going to install GPS trackers or things like that on onto phones and devices, <clears throat> that you have a policy and a consent. Um, you know, there are a fair number of states that would would require you to have some kind of notice about information that you're collecting about employees. But you know, generally speaking, you know, employees might try to invoke a right of privacy of some kind um, under state law, especially if you catch them in some place where maybe they weren't supposed to be in the first place. Um, and so to head off some of that, you know, if you tell the employee in advance, hey, we're going to put this, you know, tracker on your phone and sign off because, you know, that you're aware that it's there and this is when it's operational and this is what it does, and this is the data that's collected, where it's stored, that kind of thing, you're going to be much better off if the employee later says, you know, I really don't appreciate the fact that I have this tracker on there, and you knew where I was going. And I think it's also important um, to be able to tell the employee when they can turn that off, uh, because, you know, employees generally like to turn those things off, uh, especially if they're taking unsanctioned breaks or they're doing something that they're not supposed to do. One of the things that they think of is, oh, well, I'll turn that thing off. And, you know, if you have a policy that says it's supposed to be on during working hours, anytime you're on the clock, that's helpful. But the flip of it too, is you don't want to be in a situation where the employee says, look, you're monitoring me 24 seven. So I'm practically on call 24 seven. And so you owe me pay for 24 seven because I have, you know, I don't have any time off because this thing's following me around and beeping everywhere I go or whatever it does. So, you know, try to be mindful of that and, and get, you know, good documentation in place about what you're doing and, and have the employee sign some kind of authorization or consent so that, you know, there's no question that the employee knew, you know, what was going on and what the ground rules are. Okay. The second question is, what are the most common equal pay law claims being filed? The bogus kind. <laughs> the meritless kind. Not always. Not <laughs> As someone who used to represent plaintiffs, um, I know that these Equal Pay Act claims are pretty difficult to prove. Um, I mean, generally speaking, and the basis for an Equal Pay Act claim is, this, is if you have two employees of you know, one male, one female in similar or the same positions, and yet the male employee is getting paid more, that's potentially a basis for an Equal Pay Act claim. 
Um, the thing is, though, is that there could be a number of legitimate non-discriminatory reasons to justify the pay difference, um, whether that be length of employment with the company, ex you know, experience, education. Um, so, so long as there is a legitimate reason to point to that's non-discriminatory to justify the pay difference, then there really shouldn't be any issue. Um, but yeah, those equal pay act claims are tend to be hard to prove. Yeah, although I do think you know there there's a cultural shift going on, and you know, and we're seeing you know pay transparency laws where you know the information has to be disclosed, as well as much more willingness of employees to talk about how much they they get paid and what their salaries are and the like. I mean, and you know. I back in, you know, when I was young and dumb, you know, that wasn't really something that we talked about, like how much are you getting paid, you know, and that kind of thing. It was sort of considered to be taboo and hands off. And I just I don't think people do that as much any you know, worry about that as much anymore. And so, you know, between the transparency laws that are out there that I think we've got a question on a little bit later, um, and the fact that people talk more. I think there will be an uptick in these and and they will be in you know that category of look we have the same job title and we're subject to the same job description and yet you know this other person's making you know 50 cents more per hour or you know five thousand dollars per year or whatever it is and you know it it will be more important to watch for you know, what the reason is, you know, for these pay discrepancies, because as Catherine said, there are many legitimate reasons why they can happen. And I do think you want to be more in tune and just watching for those because, you know, you can't trust that employees, you know, aren't going to, you know, include how much they get paid in, in general water cooler talk anymore. Right. right. Okay, awesome. This next one, um, this person's located in Texas, but I'm not sure if it matters. Um, staff is paid commission for cleaning houses, but must be on call Monday through Friday, nine to five. Do they need to be paid during the downtime? Yeah, so issues, uh, the issue of whether or not downtime or on call time is considered compensable it tends to be a very fact specific analysis. Um, and essentially it boils down to how much leeway is this employee being given while they're on call? Um, are they just sitting around at home, just waiting for a call and as soon as they get the call, they have to go? Or are they just waiting in between cleaning houses at a coffee shop? There's a lot of different factual considerations that go into determining whether or not that downtime would be considered compensable. Um, Pete, do you have any examples for the difference between what would be compensable on call time versus not? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it really is that length of the leash that Catherine's talking about and whether or not you've got the right to decline, whether or not you're subject to, you know, other, you know, restrictions on your activities and things like that. Um, but, you know, I will note that, you know, what we're looking at in this question is, you know, it's a commission service employee, which is an exemption under uh, federal and presumably state wage laws. And so it's important to know whether or not those hours would be deemed compensable because what we're talking about here are straight commissioned employees. And in order to fall under that exemption, the rule is that every week they need to make more than one and a half times uh, the minimum wage, I, I think is what the rule is. And so if you've got fluctuating hours and you've got an issue where, you know, these, uh, you know, uh, the downtime hours could be deemed compensable, you know, you may need to calculate whether or not these commissions are, are are supporting the exemption. Otherwise you could run into an OT problem later. Um, so it it is important to get right. And you know, I, I think the best way we can describe it here is just, 
you know, essentially, if the employee isn't assigned to do work and they don't have anything going for them, um, how free are they? You know, are they on, you know, you have to be there in 20 minutes and, you know, you can't decline it. And so, you know, if you have tickets to go see uh, Harry Styles, you know, you, you may, you, know, you may need to leave or you can't, you know, buy a beer while you're at that concert because, you know, you're going to have to hop into a car and be subject to all kinds of restrictions. And if you're doing that, yeah, then, <laughs> then that downtime isn't really downtime, is it? Right. Correct. Yeah. Speaking of pay, um, I think that leads into this one really well. Can we mandate overtime to our employees? Generally, yes. I think that's a simple answer unless you have anything to add, Pete. Well, you know, look, I think yes. Generally, yes, is the right answer. You know, you need to look at, um, you know, union versus non-union, because obviously if there's a collective bargaining agreement, there's going to be restrictions on that. And then, you know, you do also want to watch, you know, for the category of employee, because, you know, there are certain, uh, you know, types of jobs where you, you know, would not uh, be able to man mandate overtime. Nurses is one, you know, where you really got to, you know, take a look and, and make sure uh, on mandatory overtime. But, you know, generally speaking in, in a broad swatch of, of, of job categories, yes, the employer has the right to say, this is an overtime week or these are your, this is your schedule and it includes overtime and you need to be here for those hours. <clears throat> okay, that's very helpful. I'm gonna move over to this one about employee handbooks. So this one asks, how often should companies revise their policies or procedures manuals? Every year, every two to three years or longer? Well, I it's definitely weak. wouldn't, what was that? What's a week if you're paying later? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I definitely wouldn't go longer than a year. I mean, employment laws are always changing and it's critical that you're up to date and making sure that your handbook is comporting with the most recent employment laws. Um, so yeah, often, um, but I wouldn't let it go more than you know, a year. Yeah, I mean, what we're seeing a lot of these days is that, you know, for reasons. Um, there's a lot of activity going on at the state and local level, you know, especially in, you know, coastal cities, uh, Chicago, and those laws are changing all the time. I mean, we're going to see a mandatory notice law in Illinois as soon as the governor signs, or I'm sorry, mandatory paid leave law in Illinois as soon as the governor signs it. And it is critical if you're in states and, and local areas where, you know, the laws are changing all the time and things are getting updated all the time that you stay on top of these issues because a lot of these laws that are coming out include notice requirements and your notice goes in your handbook and you can use your handbook to communicate uh, you know, notice issues, just like, you know, I mean, think of your standard FMLA policy, for example. And so, you know, if you're not keeping track of these things, uh, your handbook can get behind, and then you may be violating a notice requirement. And you may not necessarily know, you know, that uh, the laws have changed. And so, you know, I mean, one recommendation I would make is, you know, you, you gauge whether or not your handbook gets changed based off of watching, you know, things like the HR simple blog, right? If you're in a jurisdiction where every week, you know, something relevant to you pops on HR simple, well, you know, that probably translates into, you know, a handbook revision uh, or at least the inquiry. And I would also leave it with, you know, you want to talk to an employment lawyer about whether that handbook needs to be revised. There are a lot of people who are out there who 
you know, we'll make comments about a handbook and want to talk to you about your handbook and things like that. And, you know, I, the way I look at it, you know, I go to my dentist to take a look at my teeth. I don't go to my accountant for that. And, you know, it's the same thing. You want to have a, you want to have a, your lawyers uh, taking a look because, you know, we've got the best knowledge of not only what the law is, but how it plays out in real time and, and, and what, you know, these goofy laws sometimes really mean and, and how you may be able to implement it best. Can I ask a question? That's a really good point. I, I've never thought of it like that before about, you know, you, you do hire specialists for everything, really. <clears throat> do you, what's the best way to um, communicate that um, there has been a, a big handbook or employee handbook revision? especially when you have a workforce of people that might be hybrid, they might be working from home exclusively. What do you think? That is a excellent, excellent question. So, you know, generally speaking, you want to, if you're going to do, you know, a big revision of the handbook, you may want to publish it to everybody and, and, you know, send it out by a notice through a web portal I mean, in the olden days, you know, you would send them to a printer and and get paper copies and distribute them because the key is that you want to get a sign off from the employee that they received it, that they had a chance to take a look at it, that they understand what it what it says and that they had the right to ask questions so that, you know, you've got, you know, a documented uh, exchange of information because, you know, a good handbook, you know, includes a lot of notice to the employees and rules that the employees need to follow. And the best way to show that the employee is aware of those rules and understood that they existed what is to get that sign off. And so, you know, if for you know, from my perspective as a management side, you know, employment lawyer and litigator, we want to have, you know, contemporaneously signed, um, you know, notices from the employees saying, you know, yes, I got this. Yes, I had a chance to read it. And, and I know that these policies exist so that if there's something in there that said, you know, for example, in Illinois, it's important that employees know that they need to turn in their business expenses within 30 days. And if you have that policy and the employee fails to follow that policy, you know, you may you may get some protection under our wage laws, but in Illinois, business expense can be treated, you know, just like any other unpaid wage claim if the employee's following the policy. And so having that policy and having the documentation in place might save you from the employee coming in and saying, I've got five years worth of expenses that I want paid. And, you know, and if you don't pay them, you know, I'm going to go to a lawyer and have it treated like a wage, wage payment claim under state law in Illinois. Um, if you can document that the employee got the handbook, that the handbook has the proper policy, and that they signed off on it, it's a lot easier to say, look, there should be no confusion. You've got documentation, yeah, which is from talking to all of you employment law attorneys, ingrained in my brain now that documentation is the most important thing. If it's not written down, it never happened. <laughs> yes. Okay, I see a really good question here um, submitted by somebody from one of our attendees. Um, this says, What's the best way to terminate a pregnant employee working in Illinois that's been demonstrating performance deficiencies prior to being informed of her pregnancy status? Tough one. Or <laughs> seems like that's, it's a tough one. That's a doozy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. All right. Well, again, I know you like we are to be not challenged. providing so. legal advice. <laughs> we're not providing legal advice, but I will say this goes into what we were just talking about with documentation, documentation, documentation. If you have an employee who's pregnant and you are gearing up to terminate her because of performance issues, it's really important that it's well documented that she's been having these performance issues um, because otherwise you're definitely opening yourself up for her to turn around after she's terminated and file a charge at the agency saying 
you know, she was terminated because she was pregnant. Um, the other thing to be mindful of and, and part of the analysis, these types of discrimination claims is looking at how you treat your employees who are not within her protected category, so i.e. your non-pregnant employees. If you can point to other employees who you've terminated for having performance issues who weren't pregnant, then you are on solid ground to say oh, this was not because she was pregnant that we terminated her. Um, so yes, just have everything very well documented. Yeah, I mean, you want to you want to make sure that the documentation in place uh, shows that the decision was fair and reasonable, because the likelihood here is that somebody's going to be taking a look at it who doesn't work for you and doesn't owe you anything. And uh, you know, so the better documents you have that this was objective this is fair because other folks were subject to the same rules and were disciplined for not following the same rules or not performing in the in the same oh. way um you know needs to be there so that you can make a very convincing case that you know what you did was fair reasonable and, and appropriate under the circumstances because you know you're in a situation where you know not only are the legal protections there, but you know it's a highly sympathetic situation that anybody's going to take a look at and and want to give the benefit of the doubt to to the employee, and you know so document 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 and but also the other thing you want to watch for though is if you weren't documenting before. Um, you don't want the documentation to start with that employee and only that employee after you got notice of uh, the pregnancy, because you know that's that would be you know they figured look that one out right. That one's been figured out already, and so you know somebody looking at the timeline would say, "Oh, <laughs> okay, so the rule mattered only after you found out that the employee was pregnant." And, you know, so those are the kinds of fairness and documentation considerations you want to keep in mind. Okay, this is a really good question that I think applies to everybody right now. Can we write staff up for coming to the work site when they are knowingly not feeling well? Even though we are mask optional at this time, we do still speak about self-assessment prior to coming to work. It's an interesting question. And I guess I mean, my first thought is how could you verify that the person wasn't feeling well when they came in or, you know, sometimes people come into work and then an hour into their shift, they start to not feel well. So it seems like, you know, there's some factual questions there, but what do you think, Pete, as far as having a policy in place that would write them up for if there was a way to verify that they came into work knowing that they were sick. Yeah, I mean, this is a good, this is a really, you know, it, it's a question we thought a lot about with, with the pandemic and, and had to talk a lot about, and it's a good one. Um, I have been, you know, taking the position that you're far better off to be carrot here and not stick. You know, you want to encourage the employees to know that you don't want them there if, if they're not feeling well. And if there's an issue, you know, you've got to balance that against, you know, oh, I have a hangnail, so I don't feel like working today, obviously. Um, and the problem that, you know, some employers have where the day before the holiday, you know, all of a sudden everybody, you know, <laughs> have a little cough, right? But you know, by and large, I, I think you're better off looking at ways to encourage employees to understand that it's encouraged to, I don't know how many times I'm going to use the word encouraged here, but we're going to use it at least three more times It works. Uh, to, you know, come forward, not show up for work if they're not feeling well, take advantage of telecommuting if that's available to you, you know, or work from home options if that's available to you and you know have people feel safe and saying you know i'm not feeling very well uh and 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 i'm not going to be working today 
rather than you know trying to take the position that you know they just that you know halfway through their shift um you know they say they've got a fever and you know the bubonic plague or whatever and they need to go home and you're going to write them up and say you know that that was a violation of, of our policy and the concern really you know putting aside the laws and the ADA and and that kind of thing FMLA retaliation sick leave retaliation and the like that might be implicated by some of this depending on you know how things play out you know what you really don't want to do on some level is have the employee you know walking around you know coughing on people and you know they they look like uh um, you know, they're, they're, they're death warmed over, but insisting that, you know, they're, they're perfectly fine. And, you know, because they're afraid that now that they've shown up, they're going to get in trouble uh, for being ill. And, you know, I guess I was thinking of Doc Holliday from Tombstone, right, where he's coughing and he's got blood on the rag and, but he announces, I'm in my prime. You don't need that. You know, the guy had tuberculosis. You don't want that. <laughs> Um, okay. We have lots of questions coming in. Um, they, these are all such good questions. I think these two might go together well, but tell me if I'm wrong. So are there any legal requirements to pay out a notice of resignation in an at-will employment situation? And then secondly, are there any hard and fast rules regarding severance packages to offer? So maybe we can tackle them separately or together. you yeah, no, I, I think they are related questions. I think the first question, if you're, is an employer required, are there any rules uh, for an employer paying out, say an employee comes to you and says, I'm giving my two weeks notice today. Um, is there, can the employer just go ahead and terminate that employee on the spot or do they have to continue to pay them for the remaining two weeks of their two week notice? Um, generally, I would say it's fine if, you know, if an employer wants to terminate the employee instead and avoid having to pay them for the next two weeks, they can do that, but you want to be mindful of the circumstances because you might have a situation where an employee approaches you and says, uh, you know what, I'm sick and tired of this place. I've been getting harassed by so-and-so and I just can't do it anymore. I'm giving my two weeks notice today. And then the, you know, if you as the employer are saying, okay, you know what, you're actually terminated as of today, well, then you're opening yourself up to potential issue of retaliation for reporting, you know, sexual harassment. So, I mean, but also, you know, an alternative is if you don't want the employee to continue to come into work for, you know, you want to avoid them stealing information or continuing to have access to their email and all that. That's fine, but you'd still have to pay them for the remaining two weeks. Um, so basically, no, there's no, you know, hard and fast rules for this, but you just want to be mindful of the circumstances if you're going to want to terminate the employee instead of having them remain there for their two week notice. Right. Um, I mean, at will is still at will. You're not buying a two week contract. Uh, of term employment if you if you give two weeks notice um, and you can you know decide to let the employee go on the spot you could decide you know it, it some employers would say oh geez look at the PTO bank right you've got you know two weeks of pay left somebody gave two weeks notice we're going to have to pay out that PTO if we let the employee go so why don't we put somebody into, you know, kind of a vacation status and, and burn their PTO that way, um, but not have the employee come in, not have the employee work. I mean, you know, there are obviously situations, as Catherine said, where you just may not want that employee around uh, for reasons that are lawful and permissible, not the retaliatory ones that, that Catherine mentioned. Um, and, and you're not locked into it. Um, just because the employee gave notice, I couldn't. Nobody around here would would you know abide by a situation where I gave you know a hundred years advance notice and and then the firm had to pay me for a hundred years. So it's the same concept. 
Uh, severance packages are, are a yeah. good one too. I mean, you know, so the question of, is, is there a hard and fast rule of the amount to pay? No. You know, what you're trying to bargain for is a yes. And you can do one week per year of service. You could do two weeks per year of service. You could do a round number that makes sense to the employee based off of what they've gotten paid. You can do something that you think is fair, you know, in terms of of, of just picking the number. Um, the other, you know, are there rules? Yes. Um, if there's an over 40 employee, you know, you got to give them 21 days to look at it, seven days to revoke. In Illinois, if you're including non-disparagement or confidentiality provisions, that's going to trigger a 21-7 uh, notice requirement. Minnesota has some kind of notice provision that, I, that applies to all agreements. Um, California has magic language that, that belongs in there as well. So there are documentation requirements and there are notice requirements. There's some of them are revocation rights, meaning you know, that the employee can blow up the agreement, kind of like a lemon law, that you do want to be mindful of when you're when you're creating the document. But you know, um, before there were a million plaintiff sized lawyers doing employment work, you know, I'd offer people 500 bucks and I'd get it. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know the law started to get enforced and it became a lot more expensive uh, to offer up these severance agreements. And, you know, I don't want to peg a number because I don't want to set the floor for anybody. Um, I do like, you know, the olden days of 500 bucks in a six pack, uh, you know, it would be enough to get her done and, and kind of miss that. <laughs> not in 2023. No. <laughs> six pack and not alcoholic, of course, right? <laughs> right. This is know. did oh, it I'm mean, sorry. did I miss anything, Catherine? I mean, no, I, I think I think you covered it. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is an interesting one. I guess I don't need to Okay. So this person asks, what is the best way to handle marijuana use in the workplace with respect to being legalized in a state where the use is okay from medicinal to recreational? Is the use therein as it relates to someone being at work up to the employer? And how is it defined by the employer in terms of safety standards and quality control slash assurance in manufacturing environment? This is that a great go, that was a lot of words, but That's yeah. A lot. yeah. I am the office weed guy though, Catherine. I don't know if you knew that. You're the office weed guy. <laughs> what does that mean? Office... What does that mean? <laughs> it, means... <laughs> it means I deal with the, these questions a lot. Okay. So okay. maybe you're better equipped because I, I just recently had a case where I was looking into this and my the where I came out is that the law is still not updated. Um and it's there's a lot of gray area with this, um, but yeah, I think the question brought up safety concerns, especially in the manufacturing industry. That's all, le those are all legitimate concerns to have if you're having employees and you wanna make sure that they're not coming into work after you know being high, um, but there's a lot of gray area to this issue. Yeah, I mean, this again, you know, in the olden days, I didn't make any money off of drug policies because, you know, it was easy. You did drugs, you're you're engaged in criminal behavior, and we don't have to employ right. somebody engaged in criminal behavior. It's awesome, um, except for the fact that we could make no money off of it as lawyers. So, you know, now with cannabis in particular, you know, you've got a lot of different movement in, at the state. And so, like, for example, in New York, you know, the rule is essentially you need to prove that the employee is impaired and that that impairment actually caused a problem in the workplace on a general level, more or less, I think, right? Um, Illinois is a little bit different in that, you know, you can look at somebody and make a reasonable suspicion type determination on the employee related to impairment and make a decision off of that so long as you give the employee the chance to uh, refute what 
you know, you've made a term, you know, basically make the it wasn't me speech um, and make a decision about that. You know, generally speaking, employers can say you're not allowed to bring uh, cannabis uh, or cannabis containing products onto our property, regardless of whether or not it, uh, the cannabis is legal in the state. It gets a little bit tricky when you've got um, creams, you know, medicinal type, um, you know, I use a sports, you know, cream at home. It's got CBD in it. My guess is it's probably got a pretty low level of THC in it. Um, and those do get prescribed. And there have been some ADA type cases out there, generally favorable to the employee or I'm sorry, to the employer, but, you know, they're out there, um, you know, where somebody would say, hey, you know, my doc says, you know, I need, you know, this treatment and and it's a, you know, some kind of, you know, uh, lotion or something that's got a THC content in it, hopefully a low. Um, and generally right now the courts have, have, have said, no, you don't have to allow somebody to bring that on, on, on to pro onto the property, even if, you know, cannabis is legal for medical or recreational use. The other really, really hard part right now is demonstrating impairment in states or, or cities where impairment matters and is the decision point. Because you can send that employee off for a drug test. And, you know, if it's a hair sample, you're talking about a 90 day look back. If it's a, uh, if it's a urine sample, it could be a two week look back. It could be a month look back. Uh, blood sample, same kind of thing. It could be, you could be looking at something that happened over the course of a month. And there's no correlation between the number that the lab is going to give you and whether or not that individual is impaired. And so you could come back with something from the lab saying, you know, a thousand and the cutoff for reporting is 50. And I don't remember, I think it's micrograms per liter, but I really don't remember. Um, and say, oh, look at that. You know, that's, you know, 50 times or 200 times, you know, the, the reporting limit, you know, we, we've got this guy you know, he, he's impaired. And then you would ask that medical review officer, you know, if they would back that up. And the answer would be no, this actually has absolutely no correlation because a lot of it depends on how often the employee uses uh, a cannabis, you know, containing product, the levels of the THC in it and, and the like. And if you've got a frequent user, um, they're always going to be uh, metabolizing, uh, you know, cannabis in their system. And they're always going to be hitting, you know, different levels. And you're going to have no idea whether or not uh, that person's impaired. And that may make a difference, you know, depending on, on where you're at. Um, but, you know, the other thing to keep in mind, you know, with, with manufacturing facilities is I get, I get the question a lot about, hey, my position safety sensitive. Isn't there a rule about safety sensitive? And the answer to that is yes. In Department of Transportation governed and other, you know, um, you, know uh, you know, Coast Guard governed and, and, you know, there are different laws. Manufacturing doesn't have that. And so you could have a forklift operator, you could have somebody who's working in a steel plant, somebody who's working in a very dangerous situation and it feels safety sensitive, but you know it's a different term. It's a term of art that applies in very limited circumstances, not generally the manufacturing section, sector, transportation sector, absolutely. So you do have to watch for that as well. Um, but you know it it's it's a mess. It really is these days. Um, and you know. If you can at least bring in workers who are, who are under 21, it gets a lot easier again, because in a lot of states, you know, it's still not legal for them. And, and you can go back to the olden days type rules. Okay. That is so complicated. I, I mean, it's just, I guess that there's, there is the issue of uh, these laws, I guess these marijuana laws have changed so much over the last couple of years. and 
the laws about it, having it in the workplace and stuff just are not keeping up. And so, yeah, employers just have to determine this all by themselves. And that's really tough. Yeah, I mean, the hardest part is that the testing regimens just, you know, they don't have, it's not like BAC, you know. Right. The alcohol test is was always easy. Uh, cannabis. And it should, because it shows up right away. If you drink last week, it's not going to show up on the test from today or yesterday or whatever. Yeah. So. No, you can get a pretty good correlation to how impaired somebody is and when they, you know, how much they had to drink and when they stopped drinking uh, off of a BAC. You can't get that with cannabis because up until, you know, cannabis legalization started to happen, it didn't matter. And so mm -hmm. it was perfectly fine to say, you know, you're above a detectable level. Um, and we have a, a zero tolerance policy in a drug-free workplace, and you're in violation of it. And in some states, that's fine. It still holds. Right. Um, but others, it just, it doesn't anymore. Depends. Yeah. Okay. This is an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> so this person is um, located in Pennsylvania, where there's no transparency laws. Um, post job ad on Indeed for a remote position so they can work anywhere in the U.S. out of their home, which becomes the work state. Does this employer need to follow pay transparency laws, wage ranges, et cetera, because the ad is reaching every state, every state? I guess what, what does the employer, what law does the, the employer need to follow for pay transparency? Pete, you want to handle this one? <laughs> <laughs> We're getting these a lot lately because everybody's working from home yeah. and moving. Yeah, this is right. an issue that comes up a lot. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, I mean, this is this is a tough one because, you know, generally the law where the company is is the law that you would follow and, and the law that applies. Now, you know, you could run into a situation where if you're hiring a lot in a particular state and, and you're ending up with a lot of employees in a particular state outside of Pennsylvania, you know, you might start to create an argument that, you know, the laws of, of a different state would apply to you. Generally speaking, merely the fact that you advertise over the internet wouldn't necessarily bind you to the laws of all 50 states um, or, or say that the law of any state governs what you do. But, you know, if you have enough going on in, in a different state where, you know, somebody could say, you know, look, you've got 10 employees in New York now. And so you're doing business in New York now, even though you're Pennsylvania based, your headquarters in Pennsylvania and, and your, all of your operations are in Pennsylvania. Somebody could start to say that the laws of New York might also apply to you, just as a for example. Um, but generally, what you'd be looking at would be, you know, kind of the number of transactions that would be happening the number of hiring decisions that would be happening out of a particular state and whether somebody could start to say, yeah, it's fair and it's reasonable and you should have expected that Illinois law is going to apply to you too um, or New York or some other, you know, New Jersey or some other place. But that first ad, I would take the position, you know, probably not. You could tailor it to the laws of, of Pennsylvania only. Um, and, and that should be okay, you know, under, under kind of that general concept of, you know, when does the law of another state apply to an out-of-state business? Okay. That's taken me back to like first year law school civil procedure, just to be honest with everybody here. <laughs> <laughs> Long time ago, right? Long time ago, ancient history. <laughs> okay, this, um, this person, uh, is looking to find out about uh, full-time, part-time employees. Their, their employees are seeking a reduced work schedule. So they wanna work three to four days a week. Um, basically wanting to know what determines a full-time employee versus a part-time employee. 
I mean, the simple answer is, you know, if they're scheduled to work at least 40 hours a week and they, in reality, work those 40 hours a week, they're going to be considered a full-time employee who should be getting um, all the benefits that come along with being a full-time employee. Um, that's the simple answer. Maybe there's some more nuance to it, Pete. Well, you know, I mean, so you the first thing you would want to do is take a look at at your benefits policies and talk to your benefits providers and and find out, you know, do they have any particular cutoff where they're going to say, you know, this is what a full-time employee means, this is what a part-time employee means and the like. You do have a lot of latitude to define that for yourself so long as, you know, you're consistent and so long as, you know, whoever you are triggering, you know, your, your benefits obligations with and, and your TPAs and your other providers are all understanding who's in and, and who's out and they're on board with it. So, you know, 37 and a half hour a week, still full time, probably, um, you know, if somebody's cutting down to like three days a week, you know, I, I guess the question I would have is, you know, if they're if the employee is supposed to be paying a portion of their benefits, you know, and they're only going to work three days a week and they're going to be paid portionate to a three day work week. You know, if you've got a Cadillac benefit plan out there and they're supposed to be paying half of it, you know, what's their take home pay going to look like? Right. Um, it may not make sense. And, you know, it's that it's those kinds of practical issues that you really have to assess in terms of um, when you're going to start to cut off and say, you know, if you're only working, you know, 25 hours a week, if you're only working 30 hours a week, we're going to consider you part time as opposed to full time. Uh, but, you know, no, there really isn't you know, like a firm cutoff at, you know, 35, you're part-time and, you know, 36, you're full, you know, uh, that, that, that are out there. 40 obviously is the trigger for overtime, but that's not really, you know, nobody's looking for overtime. It doesn't work, right? it doesn't work the you other know, way. Yeah. We're the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We have a few more here. If a salaried employee runs out of PTO, sick or vacation time, can the employer prorate pay during a payroll cycle for an employee who did not work a full day? Did that make sense to you? It does. And I think the answer to that one is, is no. Um, you know, generally speaking, under the salary basis test under the Fair Labor Standards Act, if you have an employee that works a partial work week, you're supposed to pay the full work week because um, the the idea with being salaried is that you have a job to do, and it's the number of, and the number of hours that it takes to get the job done is irrelevant. And so, if you start to say, "Hey, you're only here, you know, two days a week, so we're going to you know lop your pay down um, proportionately." you're starting to treat that person as an hourly employee. And if that happens too often, um, you would be in a situation where somebody could say, hey, I'm an hourly employee. And all of those weeks where I worked a 60 hour, 80 hour week for you, now I get OT for those. Right. That totally makes sense. All right. Can an employer require individuals to carry health insurance? Catherine, what do you think of that one? <laughs> so this gets into the world of employee benefits, which it's its own thing. And there's some considerations under the ACA, um, which I'm not totally up to date with. But generally speaking, again, there's no law that prohibits an employer from requiring that an employee um, carries health insurance. but you just want to be mindful. If you're an employer who has at least or has 50 or more employees, you're going to be subject to the mandates under the ACA. And so you want to be mindful of those requirements. 
Yeah, I think you also need to watch, you know, the, I mean, if the, if, if the question is, can I require the employee to use my benefits? You know, there's also, you know, a state uh, deductions issue that would come up. And if the employee's saying, I'm not signing, you know, your, your benefits, you know, uh, policy, and I'm not going to agree uh, that you can take deductions for benefits, you might run into a state wage law issue. I'm not sure of that. It really is a tricky question for the benefits lawyers to deal with because there's a law called ERISA that I'm not terribly familiar with that, you know, might come into play. Um, so I, it's, it's complicated. It's like my okay. Facebook relationship. Okay, <laughs> we can leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> benefits are the whole other... It's a whole other thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got one here that says, if employees leave their time cards incomplete, um, missing punches or failing to submit for paid time off, can we just pay the hours the time card indicates and make any um, verifiable adjustments in the next payroll? I mean, my initial thought is know that you want to take every single measure possible to make sure that you're paying for the work that was actually performed during that payroll period um, and not tacking it on to the next payroll period, if I understood the question correctly. Um, yeah, Pete, what do you think? Yeah, I'm much more comfortable with contemporaneous changes than, you know, sort of the, the week following uh, because, you know, you, you, you want to catch the stuff in real time to the extent that you can, and you want to be careful with the employees so that you're not running into a situation where, you know, the, the employee is suddenly changing their story about why the time isn't marked properly, yet you knew they were there because, ultimately, the onus is on the employer to maintain accurate records when they know that the employee is working. Okay. We only have a few more minutes. There's probably going to get, there's probably going to be some questions that we don't get to, but we Lightning will. Round. Come on, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> okay. This is regarding salaried employees with exhausted PTO, but if they have run out of PTO and still want time off, we still have to pay them for their full salary. Um, I think she, she's pushing back on your, on your other answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, you, no, I mean, you're not, you're not required to eat, you know, to, to eat the situation, right? You could tell the employee that they don't have leave available, that the time isn't excused. I mean, generally speaking, when somebody, you know, doesn't have PTO available and they're not showing up, it's a discipline issue. It's not a hit them in the pocketbook issue. Um, you know, we have employers that, you know, borrow against future accruals and they have employees sign agreements saying, you know, that the time off is being borrowed against future accruals and it's worth X dollars. And so we're going to treat it like a cash advance. And, and, you know, and, you know, if the employee quits and they're still at a negative balance, you're authorizing you know, the employee to, you know, to take a deduction on the, on, out of the last paycheck or do something to get paid back. But, you know, it's, it, it generally, it's better to handle it as a discipline issue an excused absence issue and a leave time, you know, management issue than it would be to, to just, you know, start adjusting the employee's pay. Okay. 